How many people here expect to receive Christmas gifts? How many here have a plan to give Christmas gifts? Hey, what a bunch of cheapskates. I didn't see the <laughs> I didn't see all the hands go up either way. You know, whether you are uh, giving, receiving, or some of both, there are certain things that we all want when it comes to Christmas presents. We want them to please the ones we give them to, don't we? You, you don't give the, the, the Christmas gift and then go hide out in the kitchen and make a coffee while the person's opening up their gift. You want, you want to be there, you want to, see, you, know, you want to see the look on their face, you want, you want to please them. And we'd also like it to be a surprise. Oh, oh, you know, we, we want that reaction. It's part of the joy. And of course, we love to receive gifts that show that the other person really thought about us, really knew you know, what we wanted, what would make us happy, kind of tells us, wow, they really thought this, this thing through. And we especially appreciate those gifts that demonstrate that the person who gave us the gift actually made a special effort somehow to get this thing from us. Didn't stop by the 7-Eleven on the way home from work. You know. I think that in the end, it's these kind of things that make the exchanging of gifts special and pleasing and, and satisfying. Of course, the very first Christmas gifts had all of these attributes. And I'm referring to the gifts that the wise men brought to the baby Jesus when he was born. Now before we, you know, I get emails on Monday morning. I know that, let's face it, it wasn't Christmas back then as we, as we know it today. I mean there was no Santa, no shopping, things like that. But the essence of what we strive to express at Christmas time today was there 2,000 plus years ago. That same feeling, that same idea was there. For example, there was joy and happiness at the event of His birth, just as there is joy and happiness during this season. It was a joyful time. Today we, we sing carols and we wish each other Christmas greetings, and in that time the Bible says the angels praise God, saying glory to God in the highest of heaven and peace on earth to those with whom He is uh, God is pleased in Luke uh, chapter 2, 13 and 14. So there was praise going on and joy and the exchange of expressions of joy then as, as now. Now there are signs and decorations today that mark the specialness of the Christmas season. You know, there are lights and wreaths and vibrant colors and decorated trees, all that kind of stuff for those who wish to celebrate. And I know that many of these symbols were once part of a various cults and pagan religions of long ago, but what is important is what they have come to mean to us now, today, not what they meant 1,500 years ago in some obscure you know, tribe. Today the lights and the colors and the decorated trees and the rest, all of it symbolize a very real historical fact that Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God, was actually born to Mary. That's what it means. You ask anybody on the street, even if they're not Christians, ask anybody on the street, you know, what's that about? What are the lights about? What are the trees about? What are the gifts about? Well, it has something to do with Jesus. Yeah. Very, very few people would answer, oh, all of this? Oh, this is about some Teutonic cult you know, back in the 12th century. Nobody would say that to you. Today we have lights on our homes and on our trees that signal this fact. Back then there was a light in the sky, a special star that announced this good news, Matthew 2, 7 to 10. Now the star is gone, but we remember it with other bright objects that witness this event each year. I mean, don't we often put a star on our tree? Well, what does that star represent? So every time the bright lights and the decorations appear, we know it is about the birth of Jesus in the same way that when the star appeared 2,000 years ago, it was about Jesus. And of course, there were the gifts brought by the wise men. We don't know how many, probably from Babylon, modern day Iraq. Since this was the center for the study of astrology and astronomy at the time, 
In previous times, Daniel, the Jewish prophet, had been in captivity in Babylon and had a great influence for the Jewish religion in that country. It's no surprise that educated men would be interested in the seeming fulfillment of the Jewish prophecy concerning the Messiah. Where do you think they got that information? They even quote Micah, a Jewish prophet of the seventh century before Christ. Where did they get that information? We also know that God guided this trip through the star and protected them from Herod through a dream. Matthew 2 verse 12. Now the thing that most people know about them were the gifts that they brought. Passage was read, but I'll read it again now that we've kind of got that context. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, it says here, and they came into the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him, and opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. I want you to notice the type of gifts that they brought. They brought gold, and gold represented what was very, what was very best in that world and at that time. It was the highest value object that could be offered, gold. Nothing finer than gold that existed at that time, as far as something precious or valuable. They brought frankincense, a rare perfume burned on altars during worship, used as incense in the tabernacle, Exodus chapter 30 and 34. They brought myrrh, another rare ingredient used to make perfume at the time, and myrrh was one of the elements used in the burial, usually the burial of important people. All of these gifts were rare and expensive at that time, as well as dif difficult to obtain. Frankincense and myrrh wasn't something you just picked up off a shelf. Even for the wise men, they had to import this from India or Africa. Even for these men, it was difficult to obtain. And each gift had a special meaning as well. The gold was something only kings possessed in that time and in that culture, the common person did not have access to gold. This was a signal that the wise men acknowledged Jesus' true nature as king. And frankincense was used in worship, and we see the wise men worship Jesus when they found him. Doesn't it say they entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him? Not just, hello, hi, they bowed down and worshiped him. Their gift of frankincense signified that they acknowledged him not only as king, but as worthy to be worshiped as well, since frankincense was used for this purpose among the Jews. And then there was the question of the myrrh. The myrrh they brought suggested the future purpose of Jesus' life to be offered on the cross and then buried. Did they know that? No, they didn't know that. But even at his birth, through their gift of myrrh, the wise men were being used to point to the ultimate purpose of Jesus' life, which Donnie mentioned here. Lest we forget with all the celebrating, the purpose was the cross of Jesus Christ. And that was their purpose, his death, burial, and ultimately his resurrection. Now, their gifts had value and meaning and it fulfilled the need to announce the significance of the birth of Jesus. Just like today, again, I'm, I'm making parallels here. Just like today, we want our gifts to be valuable and useful as an expression about how we feel about the people we offer them to. Same parallel. And so all the elements of our present day Christmas was there at the beginning. For example, the star shone brightly in the sky to announce the birth of Jesus. And lights and decorations during this season remind us of that special light long ago. And the angels rejoiced in heaven because of the birth of Christ, and today we have a greater sense of love and joy at this time of year when we celebrate and when we remember that particular event. And the wise men brought gifts to honor and to reveal the meaning of Jesus' birth. And we today, we exchange gifts to demonstrate our love and the meaning of our various relationships one with another. And so, let me be clear, if you choose not to celebrate Christmas for whatever reason, you are free. 
Isn't that a wonderful thing? You are free in Christ to do so. If it's a day like any other, that's fine, that's good. But if it's your habit to celebrate Christmas in your home, to, to, to enjoy the time and the season, then enjoy it knowing that the joy and the fellowship and the sharing that we as Christians do at this time of year has its basis not in the world of commerce, although it's trying to take it over, not in the world of marketing because it's trying to co-opt this whole idea, but rather in the Bible itself. The Bible is the thing that talks about joy. The Bible is the thing that talks about hope and peace, not, not, not the marketers, not the internet guys. Now I want you to notice one more thing. I've made a couple of parallels about you know, the time of Jesus and the wise men and what's going on uh, during this day in our society. But I want you to notice one more thing about the wise men and their gifts uh, that Matthew mentions in chapter two. He says, then they opened their treasure chests and gave him their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The first Christmas gifts, if you wish, were for Jesus, not for Mary, not for Joseph. He was the object of the gifts. It was His birthday that was being honored, not theirs. You know, I've, I've noticed that today we give gifts to everybody else except to Jesus. We give gifts to family and friends, to customers of our businesses. We give gifts to the boss, the newspaper delivery boy, the, 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 the mailman, our teacher. At, you know, we give gifts to everybody. Everybody gets something, but there's usually nothing under the tree for the Lord. You know, it's like going to somebody's birthday party and bringing a gift for all of the guests, but nothing for the person whose birthday is being celebrated. Now someone might say, well, what could Jesus want or need you know, for Christmas, if you carry the idea with me a little bit? The Lord doesn't really need anything, surely no thing made in this world which He created, Colossians 1 verse 16. But, and, and, and work with me here a little bit, if I chose to give Him some kind of gift, if I chose to give the Lord gifts of value and meaning, then here are three that I would put under the tree and they would be just for Him. The first gift would be a life of faith. A life of faith. You know, it's so tempting to live by headlines these days. My life being guided by global warming or economic meltdown or uncertain futures or wars or disasters or scandals. It's so easy to live by those things. We're bombarded by the daily message that things are bad and things are just going to get worse. What a surprise, what a precious gift, on our, uh, what a precious gift our life of faith would be in contrast to what others are doing by worrying and by being frightened. I am reminded of the fact that the only time Jesus was amazed or surprised was when He encountered the faith of the Roman centurion who asked Jesus to heal his favorite servant. The only time where it says He was amazed, I mean, because of the conduct of someone. You know, Jesus was prepared to go to this man's house to do the healing, but the soldier simply said that he believed that if Jesus wanted it to happen, then the servant would be healed. No need to come in per person. And both Matthew and Luke record Jesus' response to this man's faith. When Jesus heard this, it says, He was amazed. My life of faith can be an amazing gift to my Lord because it stands out so remarkably from the disbelief in this world. It sparkles. It shines brightly next to the despair and the discouragement and the darkness around it. It honors the Lord like, a, like the gold of the Magi. That goal honored Him. It acknowledges Him as our King and as our Lord, as our God, and not the powers of this world. My faith for all that I need to live an honorable life 
is in Jesus Christ. Not what my government does or says, not what my company promises or not to do, not what my own strength is capable of. My faith says that Jesus is greater than these and all things are held together by Him and not human power. You know, many are saying that there are great opportunities during these troubled times. Interest rates are low, house prices are low, bargains everywhere, all you need is a little confidence. You hear the politicians saying, you know, there's nothing wrong with this country, we just need a little more confidence. Well, this is also a marvelous opportunity to show what kind of faith do we have as well. In these troubled times, living by faith would be an amazing gift to give to the Lord Jesus Christ. Gift number two, what would I put under the tree for the Lord? I think the next gift of value that I would put would be an increased commitment. You know, the fact that you are here this morning shows that you have a certain level of commitment to the Lord. The gift I'm describing here is the next level of commitment that each of us here can make in our Christian lives. Not the level that you're at now, I'm saying the next level of commitment. That's the gift that I would give him. This second gift is separate from the first in that it is different for each of us. Faith, like gold, for example, is the same regardless of who gives it. But commitment is a very personal gift and has a different look and shape for each individual. Each person here this morning is at a different place as far as their commitment to Jesus Christ is concerned. The gift that I'm talking about is the next level of your personal commitment to Christ. This would be a valuable gift to the Lord indeed. You know, it's unique for every person because each person as I said, is at a different level of commitment in their faith to Christ. For example, for some people, the next step in commitment would be to be baptized. You know, they believe, they love God, they just haven't obeyed this command yet. For others, the next level of commitment may be a greater effort to deal with sinfulness in their lives. You know, a gift of a holier life offered to God. For many, the gift may be a higher commitment to the Lord's body, which is the church. You know, we have over 300 members, close to 400 members in this congregation, but rarely is everyone here for services. We have Bible classes for every single age and teachers ready to teach, but many times the rooms are half empty because many people are just not here. We offer a midweek service, but only 40% of the church bothers to come. What's interesting is that we even offer our worship and Bible studies live online if you can't come, and yet people won't watch even from the comfort of their own homes. You know, our love for God is demonstrated by our level of commitment to worshiping and serving Him. Low commitment, low love. There's no other way, there's no other way to uh, examine that. There's no other way to explain that, low commitment, Low love. It's the same in our relationship with the Lord as it is with our partner in marriage. Low commitment, low love. Our love is demonstrated, I say once again, by our commitment to worship and serving. A high commitment to faithful attendance in order to worship God and learn from His word and support His church is like the frankincense offered to the Christ child by the wise men. When we raise our level of commitment to holier living and more faithfulness to the church, it becomes a gift of a fragrant aroma to God and to the Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, a third gift that we could put under the tree that I am absolutely positive would be appreciated is a conscious confession of our faith in Christ. You know, when the wise men offered myrrh to the baby Jesus, they could not have known the ultimate significance of their gift. As I mentioned before, myrrh was used primarily in preparing bodies for burial. Unlike the Egyptians, 
the Jews did not practice the preservation of the corpse through embalming. This was not their custom. The Jews simply cleansed the body and wrapped it in linen lined with spices and perfume like myrrh in order to deal with the, or, uh, the odor of the dead body uh, during the burial process. So the Magi looked to the ultimate death of this child. Perhaps they thought he was to be great in life and they wanted to testify to this with their gift. In other words, they're giving him a gift so that he would have a royal burial. They saw him as important, as a king, and they thought, well, when kings die, you know, they, they have a royal burial. Perhaps that was their thinking. Perhaps that may have been one of the significant factors. But they could not have known the purpose and the manner and the outcome of Jesus' death and burial and resurrection. But here's the point. We know it. We know it. The only reference indirectly to his death, or they only reference indirectly to his death, but we can openly confess not only his death for the sins of all men, but we can declare his glorious resurrection as well. You know, the plan to save all mankind from eternal destruction that was once a secret, as Paul says, Romans 16 to 25, 16 and 25 rather, that plan to save all men, to bring all men together into Christ, that plan is now known. Now, that plan is now available. Every time we share our faith or invite someone to church or teach someone the gospel, we offer the gift of conscious confession of Christ. We offer that gift. The beauty of this gift is that each time we offer it to someone, we give it to Christ. No matter how we offer it or how people react to it. The value of this gift is that it has the power to multiply into countless gifts of praise and thanksgiving by those who are saved because of our witness. You know, uh, Marty mentioned the statistics. There are 16 people, maybe they're all here this morning, who were baptized in that water back there who said in front of various witnesses, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And they obeyed the gospel and were buried in baptism. And they confessed that name to perhaps five or 10 people during a evening or morning or afternoon time, but they, that's, that's five or 10 you know, witnesses to that confession. And those 16 people since then have confessed it to others and others. You see how the gift multiplies itself? What a valuable gift to give to the Lord a conscious confession of your faith in Jesus Christ. So let me say this last thing about all three of these gifts that I mentioned. A life of faith, an increased commitment, a conscious confession of Christ. Let me tell you this about these gifts. They are true gifts because they all belong to us. They are ours to give or not to give. We get to decide if we're going to give these gifts or not. You know, the Bible says that the world was created by God and it belongs to Him. And so we really can't give what is already His. We only manage the creation and we give Him a portion back of what He has given us as an acknowledgement of this fact. But, but, God has given to us the capacity to believe or not to believe. God has given to us the ability to commit or not to commit. God has given us the choice to confess or not to confess. These things are ours to do with as we choose. We can give them or we can keep them for ourselves. Imagine the pleasure of our Lord when we choose to freely and generously and lovingly offer to Him a faithful life over a fearful life. Imagine His pleasure when we offer to Him an unwavering commitment instead of a lukewarm commitment. Imagine the joy in heaven when a host of believers who have come to Christ are before Him because we chose to confess Jesus Christ. Imagine the day in heaven when someone will say to you, I am here because of you. I believe because of you. 
What a gift that is for ourselves and what a marvelous, joyful thing that is for God in heaven. These are gifts worthy of the one who saved our souls from eternal death. Have you ever been disappointed at Christmas time? You know, you got matching socks and tie instead of the skill saw that you really wanted. Or you received a lovely card with words of love along with a new iron instead of a pass for a full day at the spa which would have done you a lot of good. Have you ever been disappointed like that? I wonder if after we you know, gorge ourselves with food and good things to eat and spending at Christmas, I wonder sometimes if God is not a little disappointed with what we have left Him under the tree. Oh, I know it doesn't work like that, but you know what I mean. Maybe after having us with all that we have at this time of year, I wonder if the Lord is disappointed that we offer Him so little in return, so little gratitude. So by all means, don't be afraid to enjoy this season in good conscience because it all comes from God and He is the one from whom all blessings flow. Enjoy it. I've wished everyone that I saw here a Merry Christmas today. And I did it with a good conscience, a clear heart, and joy in my life. I just want to make sure that if you wanted to offer the Lord a gift that would truly be pleasing to Him, you'd know what to shop for. So God bless you and have truly, truly have a Merry Christmas. And if you have a last minute Christmas gift for the Lord, perhaps a confession of faith and obedience and baptism, perhaps a renewed commitment to a holy life of service, then why not bring that forward now, on this day of all days, as we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.